over in Pyongyang, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un today sat down with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin to forge a comprehensive strategic partnership with Moscow. President Yoon song yeol declares a population state of emergency as the country's fertility rate continues to fall to hit a fresh low. Record high temperatures were recorded in Korea during the daytime for any June, prompting heat wave advisories in the capital and inland areas. It's June 19, 2024. This is News Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung-min. Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in North Korea early this morning for his first state visit to the regime in 24 years. He and his North Korean counterpart Kim Jong-un sat down for talks on establishing long-term relations. For more, we have our correspondent Choi Min-jung connecting live with us. Min-jung, Putin's two-day trip was cut short due to his late arrival, but he did receive a welcome unusually early in the morning. Tell us more. Right, Jung Min Putin arrived in North Korea early Wednesday morning at around 2.45 a.m. to a red carpet. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un greeted the Russian leader with smiles, handshakes and hugs. Now, the arrival was a rather rare scene as Kim welcomed Putin by himself, not accompanied by his officials. And what was supposed to be an arrival ceremony ended in five minutes. This perhaps was due to Putin's much later than expected arrival. But the streets were decorated with portraits of Putin and Russian flags. And at around noon, a grand welcoming ceremony took place at Kim Il-sung Square in Pyongyang. A large crowd was out on the streets to welcome the two leaders with balloons in the air and people waving flowers. And after the ceremony, the two leaders sat down for a summit. What were the key takeaways? Right. The talks went, o went on for over an hour and a half at, at Kim Susan Palace. And Putin appreciated North Korea's consistent and unwavering support for Russian policy, including on Ukraine. And Kim expressed the regime's full support and solidarity with Russia in conducting military operations in Ukraine. North Korea expresses full support for the Russian government's special military operation in Ukraine to protect its sovereignty, interests and the stability of its territory. The two also discussed ways to strengthen their bilateral ties. Putin mentioned a new fundamental document. Last year, as a result of your visit to Russia, we made significant progress in building up our relations. Today, a new fundamental document has been prepared that will outline the basis of our relationship over the long term. Kim noted that relations between Russia and North Korea are entering a new period of prosperity and emphasized that the regime intends to strengthen strategic cooperation with Russia. He also praised Russia's role in maintaining strategic stability globally. The talks came as the two sides are facing intensifying confrontations with the U.S. The Russian leader addressed the decades-long struggle against U.S. imperialist policy towards Russia during the talks as well. Putin also expressed intentions to meet Kim again, saying he hopes the next meeting with Kim will be held in the Russian capital. And Min Jong, uh, we hear Kim and Putin signed a comprehensive strategic partnership agreement as well. That's right, Jung Min. The two leaders agreed to elevate their relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership. The agreement will replace the documents that were signed in 1961 and 2000. Prior to the summit, Russia had said that the partnership would outline future cooperation and deal with security issues. And so the question is whether this will involve further military cooperation between North Korea and Russia. Pyongyang and Moscow have already been strengthening military cooperation since Kim visited Putin in Russia last September. And since then, the two sides have been heavily criticized by South Korea and the international community for an apparent arms transfer violating UN Security Council resolutions. This is all I have for now, but I'll be back with more updates in our later newscast. Jung Min. All right. Thanks, Min Jung, for filling us in. The world is closely watching this summit happening in Pyongyang. Washington is voicing concerns over deepening ties between Pyongyang and Moscow, while Beijing stays reticent. But experts say China will feel some discomfort. Kim Bo-kyung shares some insights with an expert view. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in North Korea for his first visit in 24 years, pledging strong support for the regime. This, an expert says, could make the United States worried about two aspects, peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and the war in Ukraine. The U.S. would be most worried about how North Korea's munitions could be used for the Ukraine war and prevent Washington from ending it. In terms of the Korean Peninsula, there will also be worries about North Korea's striking power, as its nuclear and missile capabilities could get a boost. These words are reflected in what Washington officials have had to say regarding Putin's visit to Pyongyang. What we are concerned about, Trevor, is the deepening relationship between these two countries. Uh, not just because of the impacts it's going to have on the Ukrainian people, because we know North Korean ballistic missiles are still being used to hit Ukrainian targets, but because there could be some reciprocity here that could affect security on the Korean peninsula. The deepening cooperation between Russia and the DPRK uh, is something uh, that should be of concern, uh, especially to anyone that's interested in maintaining peace and stability on the, the Korean peninsula. Uh, but also supporting the people of Ukraine as they continue to fight against Russian aggression. Thus, Jean-Pierre, the White House spokeswoman, has urged Putin to convey to Kim that only political and diplomatic ways should be used to resolve issues on the Korean Peninsula, as he agreed during the previous summit with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Meanwhile, media outlets have focused on how China could be left with conflicted feelings as Russia and North Korea's rapprochement deepens. Though China does recognize how inevitable it is for Russia and North Korea to become cozier with each other due to sanctions imposed by the U.S., and Beijing itself has been able to ease the pressure of having to provide international cover for Pyongyang, it cannot help but worry for their deepening bilateral ties because of the U.S. China does say a boost in North Korea-Russia ties is because of the United States, but Beijing cannot welcome their growing ties fully because it could lead to Washington's increased military involvement on the Korean Peninsula. Kim bo Arirang News. While Russian President Vladimir Putin is in North Korea, the chief of China's Jiangsu province has arrived in South Korea for a two-day visit. Shin Changshing, the Communist Party secretary of the province, met with South Korea's trade minister on Wednesday. He's also set to meet with business people in the country. Jiangsu province, located on the east coast of China, has the second largest economy among provincial governments in the country and has close trade and investment ties with South Korea. Seoul's foreign ministry said it expects this opportunity to boost practical cooperation between the two countries. Three P-8A Poseidon Maritime Patrol aircraft equipped with the latest anti-submarine warfare technology have arrived at its air command in Pohang. That's according to South Korea's Navy on Wednesday. The multi-mission aircraft produced by Boeing are capable of advanced target acquisition and surveillance using radar and are equipped with anti-ship missiles, torpedoes and depth charges. The Navy said this will strengthen its warfare capabilities against North Korean submarines and facilitate joint maritime operations with the U.S. Navy. Three more Poseidons are due to arrive at the end of this month. The plane will enter into service in 2025 after acclimation exercises for their crews. Shifting gears, President Yoon today declared a national emergency as the country's birth rate continues to fall. He said all-out efforts will be made to tackle chronic population concerns. Our correspondent Kim do explains. A population state of emergency has been officially declared in South Korea, with the government expecting the fertility rate to fall to 0.65 in 2025. This coming as President Yoon song yeol on Wednesday presided over a presidential committee on aging, society and population policy meeting, the second time to do so. The president added that three areas will be the focus of the government's all-out efforts. Work and family life balance, child care and housing. 
For work and family balance, the government aims to up the current rate of dads taking paternity leave to 50% from current 6.8. For this, the government will financially support companies temporarily losing employees while upping the first three months of the government's parental leave pay to a maximum of 2.5 million Korean won or about 1,800 US dollars from current $1,000. The government is also expanding public child care programs so children aged from 3 to 5 will receive free education and care. Lastly, for housing, newlyweds and couples with newborns will receive financial support while being prioritized when purchasing a newly built home. But that's not all. The 사회 구조적 요인과 경쟁 압력, 높은 불안과 같은 사회 문화적 요인이 복합적으로 얽혀 있습니다. 특히 우리 사회의 과도하고 불필요한 경쟁 문화를 바꿔서 더 여유 있고 성숙한 사회가 될수 있도록 노력해야 합니다. President Yoon has called the current low birth rate a national emergency before and said he will create a new ministry for this and have its minister be the deputy prime minister for social affairs, a role the current education minister holds, showing the new role's significant power and responsibility. But the creation of a new ministry will need the support of the opposition-led parliament, which is always an uphill battle. Kim do Arirang News. Turning to the medical dispute, internal discord has arisen among regional doctors' associations following the announcement of an indefinite walkout by the head of the Korea Medical Association. Choi soo brings the latest. During a national strike led by the Korean Medical Association on Tuesday, its president, Im hyun tae announced an indefinite walkout starting June 27th. However, following this statement, the president of the Gyeonggi-do Medical Association said he was completely unaware of this indefinite walkout and that all 16 regional medical association presidents were surprised by M's sudden announcement. Also, private medical practitioners said that an indefinite strike had not been discussed or decided upon. In addition, the Korean Intern Resident Association expressed opposition to the KMA. Im had proposed forming a countermeasure committee encompassing all doctors' associations and offered a co-chair position to Park Dan, the head of the KIRA. However, Park posted on Facebook on Wednesday that he too had not heard anything about this, saying KIRA would not participate, while criticizing Im's indefinite strike declaration. Meanwhile, professors of medicine at the country's big five university hospitals have either begun or are planning to begin walkouts of undetermined lengths. Medical professors at Seoul National University Hospital started an indefinite walk stoppage from Monday, excluding emergency and intensive care services. Professors at Severance Hospitals are training hospitals of Yonsei University Medical School are set to join the walkout on June 27th. Those at Asan Medical Center, the training hospital of Ulsan University, will stop work for a week starting July 4th. While medical professors at the Catholic University of Korea will discuss the matter on Thursday, and those at Songyungwan University will also hold a meeting shortly. However, even during the walkouts, the professors will ensure there is essential medical staffing for emergency and severe care services and intensive care units and delivery rooms. To minimize severe medical disruptions, the government has implemented a rotational on-call system for emergency cases. Choi soo Arirang News. Record high temperatures for any June were recorded during the daytime today all across the country. The first heat wave advisory of the summer was issued in the capital. Our Ian He tells us more. With the heat expected to last a bit longer, 
Temperatures in Seoul reached 35 degrees on Wednesday, marking the peak for this summer so far. Heatwave advisories are issued when the highest feels like temperature is expected to reach 33 degrees Celsius or higher for two consecutive days. Seoul's first heatwave advisory of the year has been in effect since Monday at 10 a.m. Let's hear from those who are outdoors braving the heat. I like sleeveless clothes. The weather is extremely hot, almost scorching. Although air quality has improved compared to last year, the intense heat makes me feel like I'm in Europe. Today I left the house without sunglasses or a parasol, and it's so hot that I'm starting to think outdoor activities might be difficult. So I think it would be better to cool off in an exhibition hall and enjoy some artwork indoors. It's really hot right now. This year's heat wave advisory for Seoul was issued one day later than last year. The entire Seoul metropolitan area is now under a heat wave advisory, except for the city of Incheon. In other regions, the heat is more severe, including Goyang City in Gyeonggi-do province, where the daytime high reached up to 37 degrees Celsius. Currently, a heat wave advisory has been issued for 92 regions across the country, predominantly in inland areas. Meanwhile, starting from Wednesday night, Jeju Island is expected to experience its first monsoon of the summer. Ian Hee, Arirang News. Turning to the economics, South Korea's overall current account surplus widened last year, but its current account balance differed with each country, as it saw a record surplus with the United States, but a record deficit with China. Our Lee Soo-jin has the details. South Korea recorded its largest ever current account deficit with China last year, but also the largest ever current account surplus with the United States. According to the Bank of Korea on Wednesday, South Korea's overall current account balance recorded a surplus of more than 35 billion U.S. dollars last year, up from around 25 billion U.S. dollars from the year before. This was mostly driven by its current account surplus with the United States surging from nearly $69 billion in 2022 to $91 billion last year. That's the largest current account surplus with the United States on record since related data was first collected. And this was led by the current account balance for goods recording its largest surplus ever thanks to strong demand for automobiles and machinery. On the other hand, South Korea's current account balance with China recorded a deficit of $30 billion, also a record high. South Korea's current account balance with China has remained in the red for two consecutive years after falling into negative territory for the first time in 21 years in 2022. And last year's deficit was greater than that of 2022. This comes as outbound shipments of goods, namely chips, plunged by a large margin, while inbound shipments of goods dropped only slightly. South Korea's current account balance with the United States has shown an increasing surplus since 2020, while its current account balance with China has shown a greater deficit in 2023 than in 2022. It looks as though this decoupling trend driven by rising exports of AI chips will continue. As for its current account balance with other nations, South Korea's current account deficit with Japan last year shrank compared to a year earlier due to decreased imports of goods such as chemical products. But its current account surplus with Southeast Asian countries fell as outbound shipments of chips, oil and chemical products fell. The Bank of Korea official said that this surplus drop seen with the Southeast Asia region was, however, offset by the record surplus with the U.S. and that the central bank believes that exports to the U.S. will remain robust for a prolonged period. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Recent data has shown that South Korea's exports are riding a high once again with the booming IT and auto industries. The Trade Ministry revealed on Wednesday that outbound shipments between January and May this year rose by nearly 10 percent compared to the same period the year before, recording the second highest sum ever for this period. In particular, IT exports such as semiconductors and computers showed a 40 percent rise and were responsible for around a quarter of total exports. Auto exports, in the meantime, recorded the highest sum on record. The country's exports have seen on-year growth for eight months straight. With the development of AI technology and automation, the concept of smart logistics is looking to become more prevalent. Our An Songjin takes a look at this trend from production to consumption.
In the age of digital transformation, from manufacturing to sales, the retail industry is looking to become more automated using robots. According to Business Research Insights, a data-based market intelligence company, the global market for automation is currently at 100 million U.S. dollars and is expected to grow to 165 billion dollars by 2031. Smart Tech Korea, a trade show hosted by the Trade Ministry from Wednesday this week, holds an array of events such as the Robot Tech Show and the Retail and Logist Tech Show, showcasing robot technology and solutions that are applied to the logistics process. But how is the process of production to consumption about to change with such connected and automated AI technology? One company says that jobs at warehouses will be further automated. If I say in future, maybe in the industry, uh, production industry for the assembly lines or maybe for assembling something. Including production, loading and packaging can also be automated with robotic arms picking up boxes weighing 20 kilograms and storing them. Most industry insiders say that companies are looking to reduce labor costs and use robots or automated technology instead for increased productivity, even if initial costs to implement the technology may be hefty. One concern most Asian countries, including South Korea, have is that as real estate prices and human labor costs rise, businesses are losing efficiency. Integrating these solutions can help enhance the return on investment. In addition to production and distribution for producers, higher industrial automation, such as the use of RFID, reduces human intervention, which may reduce error and inefficiency for consumers as well. Not only can these reduce excess costs for the producers, but they also provide better experiences for customers since they can also benefit from the automation process of unmanned sales. As more of the logistics processes are looking to become automated, factory layouts and industries will be changing accordingly. And as the trade ministry has said, the government is looking to further assist the process. An Song Jin, Arirang News. On the cultural front, the Korean historical independence movie Harbin, which tells the story of Korean independence activist An Jung-gun, is set to premiere at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. According to distributor CJ E&M on Tuesday, Harbin was officially invited to the 49th Toronto International Film Festival as part of gala presentations for its world premiere in September. The film starring Korean popular actor Hyun Bin as An jung -gun, is the new project from director Woo Min-ho known for his film Inside Men. Today saw the hottest in summer-like weather appearing, with centers hover soaring to 35 degrees Celsius, its highest temperature so far. In other metropolitan areas, Koyang moved up to 37 degrees. The scorching heat will continue tomorrow, with Seoul again seeing 35 degrees during the daytime. On the other hand, Jeju Island will experience its first heavy rain from late tonight until the day after tomorrow. There will be up to 200 millimeters of precipitation in mountainous areas of the island. In addition, 5 to 20 millimeters of rain will fall in southern parts of the country tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, Daejeon, Gwangju, and Daegu and Jeju will start off at 21 degrees. This will move up to 35 degrees in Seoul, Chuncheon, and Daejeon. The heat wave will continue for the rest of the week with no rain in Seoul. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world.
That is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching. A panel session up next.